Welcome to the HU Movemakers Podcast, where we highlight folks that are blazing the trail and making moves in Howard culture. Hello, everybody. Welcome to another edition of the HU Movemaker Podcast, where we highlight folks that have contributed to the legacy of Howard University at the highest levels. Now, today, I got someone who's currently working in enemy territory. Uh, <laughs> It's, it's Mr. Gerald L. Hector, CPA, Certified Public Accountant, all the way from Jamaica, Deloitte & Touche, United Negro College Fund, Johnson C. Smith, Ithaca College, Cornell, Howard University. That's his claim to fame. That's what I'm, that's what I'm gonna stick to. That's but right. uh, but I, I want to welcome uh, you know, Gerald L. Hector uh, to the show. He's the Executive Vice President and Chief Business Officer for Morehouse College in Atlanta, Georgia. And I, I really want to know why we didn't get that that Robert Smith money. We can talk about that <laughs> a little bit later. But uh, Mr. Hector, you know, w- welcome to the show. I'm so happy to have you. I was reading your bio. You got books, a ton of speaking engagements. I want to get into all of that. But first, I want to talk about Jamaica, man. I mean, how do you go <laughs> Jamaica to Atlanta? Like, how, how does that happen? It's a journey. It's a journey. But first of all, uh, thank you for having me. I'm extremely humbled to be a part of your show. And uh, you and I were talking off air and I wanted to say to you that um, I'm very proud of you, my brother. Thank you. Um, This type of work is needed more and more today in our community as we showcase individuals, regardless of what they do, but the positive things that needs to be showcased in our community is something that I always look forward to. I am from Kingston, Jamaica, born and raised. Um, I was born in Kingston, I grew up, had a fun life in Jamaica. Uh, sports was my, my escape. Uh, my dad tried to teach me tennis from a very young age. And when I got to high school, you know, we were under the British school system. So I got to high school at the age of 10. And when I got there, we weren't from a wealthy family. So my high school didn't have tennis as such. So I got thrown into soccer and ran track and played cricket. And uh, eventually, I was lucky enough to get an athletic scholarship to the Mecca. Uh, in 1989, I got to the United States, uh, to Howard University, the great Howard so how University. So does, how does Jamaica, a, a, a country that small, produce so many sprinters and, and, and runners? Like <laughs> well, every, you know what, I, every year I, I is somebody. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, but I can tell you, <laughs> the scuttlebug about that folks would say is, well, you know, you know, when, when we were, our ancestors were coming over in the Middle Passage, they, the last stop they made to put the rebel rousers off the ship was in Jamaica. So we've, we've been running ever since then. The history of our, our, our little tiny island and the slave revolts and everything else. I often say that, you know, it's just something that we, it's, it's innate, the pride that we carry. So track mm-hmm. and field and, and things of that nature is so highly supported. Uh, the Boys and Girls Championships, in that tiny island is one of, if not the biggest track and field event for high schools in the world. Oh, really? So it's just, um, it's a cultural thing. Uh, we, we, we love what we do. So and with sports, was that, did, did you know that uh, with, with sports, was that your ticket to higher education? Or was it you just happened to be fast and you just ran with Oh, no doubt. Uh, my, my legs were my ticket to my higher education. Okay. And um, I tell people that all the time. If I did not have these uh, the athletic ability, I would not have been at Howard. I would have been somewhere down in Miami. Uh, when we were growing up in Jamaica, we were so close to Miami. Um, University of Miami, Coral Gables used to be something that folks pined after. But, I, you know, I ended up at Howard because a track coach who knew William P. Moultrie, who is a legend. Uh, we could talk about him in a little bit. That's who I wrote my book about. And it's really a thank you to Howard University and specifically Coach Moultrie. But a young protege of his was doing some assistant coaching work at my high school in Jamaica, Kingston College. His name is Leo Brown. And uh, he saw me uh, one day and said, hey, man, let's, let's let's do this track thing. I played three sports. So I played center forward for the soccer team. And I was what we call the pace bowler for uh, the cricket team. Mm-hmm. And he saw me one day practicing and said, hey, man, would you come out and give this track thing? We, we, need, a, we need a leg on the 400 for the sprint medley. And quite honestly, the rest is history. He told me about Howard University. I didn't know anything about Howard. Uh, oh, Washington really? He was foreign to me. Um, never been to the city before. 
But uh, I remember talking to a friend of mine and I told him, I said, look, you know, people are looking at me for scholarship opportunities, but this Howard University thing, I don't know anything about it. What were some other schools that that you were considering? Um, They were talking FIU and once again, down there in the Miami area, because that's all we knew. You know, ignorance is bliss, right? Uh You can just be ignorant about what could happen. To this day, I look back and I thank God that I ended up at Howard University. Because <laughs> that institution, uh, it literally changed my life. It changed my trajectory in life. And it allowed me to link up with Coach William P. Moultrie and um, just an experience that I will never forget. So you, so, so you get a scholarship to Howard. And I, I'm imagining Howard not giving out too many scholarships like right. that, too many full ones. So you get to Howard. You're from Jamaica. What is, what is Howard like at that time? What, what year is this? This year is the fall of 1989. 1989. So I get the, on the, the track. landscape for me. What's the landscape of Howard and, 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 and just everything that you're experiencing at that time? I didn't know anyone. Um, I talk about it also in, in the book. I talk about me getting from New Haven, Connecticut on an Amtrak train. And my, I was visiting my grandmother and my uncle up in New Haven, Connecticut, and they put me on that Amtrak from New Haven to D.C. I didn't know anyone. They gave me extra money and uh, said, hey, look, make your way to campus. And I remember saying to myself, you know, I'm from Jamaica, so I got street smarts. Yeah. So I mapped out all of the names of the streets, North Capitol, Florida Avenue, and everything else, and said, okay. Got to the taxi cab stand and told the guy, hey, man, I'm late to get to campus. Start talking to him as if um, I knew where I was going. But he got me to campus. I got there to Drew Hall. I knew no one. I, uh, Coach Moultrie had looked out for me. He knew I was an international student. I didn't go through freshman orientation because of the timing of when I got to, this, to, to Howard. So I knew no one. And just for about two weeks or so, just wandered the campus, trying to find my way around, meet people. And what was your major? Things like that. What was your major? My major was accounting. Okay, okay. So, so I came Coach- in declaring accounting. Coach Moultrie obviously had a huge impact on you. What, how, how did he find you? Is, is he uh, Jamaican as well? No, Coach Moultrie is from Rockdale, Texas. Uh, he oh, likes okay. to tell us. He's a, he's a Texan <laughs> and everything is big in Texas. So he wore these uh, cowboy boots and cowboy hat, the buckle on his jeans, the whole nine yards. But when I got there, he just told me, he said, son, I want you to do two things for me. Sacrifice four years of your life for the rest of your life. And the second thing is, give me an honest effort in the classroom and on the track. If you do those two things, you're going to be successful. And so said, so done, I believe. But I took those things to heart because when I got to Howard, you know, you get into a a mode when you get to college. You know, you're turning your own key in your door. Uh, Mom and dad is not anywhere around you. But I had the added element of being a foreigner in America. Um, with a very thick accent and not having any friends, not knowing anyone, no one in D.C. I could call upon. So I was pretty much alone. And um, for the first couple of weeks or so, the only friends or colleagues or acquaintances I had were the folks on the track team. Was there any pressure being an international, uh, you know, leaving Jamaica and coming all the way to Howard? Like any, um, any, any not- pressure from the family, anything like that? No, no pressure. They were, I'm, I'm actually the first in my family to go through a four-year college experience. Oh, okay. So, you know, there was a sense of pride there. But at the same time, you know, I'll be gone. I have no way of supporting myself outside of what, what I got by way of a scholarship with a meal plan, the room, room and board, and so on. There so, was always a concern, how would I manage in the summers? But I, I used to go back to New Haven, Connecticut, and I worked odd jobs, working in a bakery with my cousin Eric got me a job there. I was a janitor one summer at, at Drew Hall, working on campus. So I just did what I had to do to get it done. I knew I had to get this degree. And um, whatever it meant for me to be surviving and make it work, I, I made it work. Uh, so I parked cars. I worked for Atlantic Ballet. Their, their, their headquarters were down on, on K Street. I worked for them for a bit. So I parked cars. I was a janitor one day, one time. I was a office manager one time, office clerk. So you name it, I, I have done it. And that has stuck with me today because I tell my staff, even today, that I'll never ask you to do something that I have never done before in my life. 
So what about being like an international student? Was it socially? What what was that like? Well, it was good because at that time, reggae music was really catching on in the U.S. in the hip hop scene. So you okay. had Beanie Man, you had Bojo Banton, you had um, uh, Bounty Killer, and <laughs> then you had the Calypso aspect of it as well catching on. So the parties were were pretty good. So by that time, hip hop was coming around, and I didn't didn't feel any tension there. But at on campus, however. The Caribbean students were tightly knit. So we had the Caribbean Students Association. Mm -hmm. And as after a while, I met um, a lot of the Jamaicans and the Caribbean folk. And from there, those guys have been my lifelong friends. And uh, some of them are so close that they're the godparents to my children. So wow. all of that happened at Howard. To this day, we are on a WhatsApp group where we check in <laughs> every day just to make sure everybody's doing all right, kids are doing all right. And that's what Howard is about. Howard is about family. And um, I'm just so grateful that I've been able, I was able to attend Howard University. So you're at Howard, you're an accounting major. That, that's a tough major. That, it that's is. tough. I, I, I'm in a school of B too. I school of B graduate. Uh -huh. I look accounting. I hate, I had, I took that over the summer just because, <laughs> so I could kick it during the school year. I hated uh -huh. anything that had to do with numbers. I mean, yeah. what was that like having your thick accent? Number one, then I know track and field, that's a demanding sport. You know, yep. I'm assuming you probably practice all year round. You probably practice before class, after class. What was that adjustment like uh, with the county, you know, just being in a county major? Discipline. One word, discipline. I, I it, it was difficult, um, but I did what everyone told me not to do. I, I sought out people like Baron Harvey, the current dean of the school mm -hmm. of business. I, I leaned on him a lot. He was actually my accounting uh, intermediate one professor. Oh, wow. And, um, you know, to this day, he and I, we have conversations. We text back and forth. He's been a big advocate for me in my career, um, always giving me opportunities to give back. But when, while there on campus, I knew I had to get it done. Um, I, I had classes with folks. I wasn't af afraid if I missed classes because of track meets or practice or things of that nature, I would have classmates that I could go to and say, hey, listen, I missed this lesson. Can you spend some time with me? So I rarely got time to sleep when I was at Howard <laughs> because it was between schoolwork, accounting major, which as you said, is a very demanding major. Outside of the actuarial science program at the time when I was there, the accounting program was the second most difficult uh, major to get through. People start as accounting majors and they get to intermediate one and just barely getting by intermediate one, they switch to finance. But I wanted an accounting degree. I wanted to be a certified public accountant. So I just had to do what I had to do. Um, so even at I, Howard, so even then, so even then uh, when you were there, the goal was to be a CPA. Absolutely. If okay. I was going to do this, I, would, I was going to go to the top. I got to get the highest level of certification. Wow. So I knew I wanted to do that from I got there. I came in declaring an accounting major. And that love for accounting and business came from my dad. He used to take me to his job uh, when I was young. He was a corporate executive for Sherwin Williams Paints back in Jamaica. And um, when we also lived in Trinidad for two years. They, they took him down there. So I lived in Trinidad for two years. But he always took me to his job and he'll bring work home. And I was always fascinated by numbers and how he made things work. And um, so I declared an accounting major coming in and I stuck with it. And um, the rest is history. I actually love numbers to which my wife, who is an engineer, wow. also a Howard two-time grad, wow. she looks at me and says, you know, you're crazy. I could never do that all day long. But, you know, I love it. So at, while, while being on the track team, did you have any success as an athlete? Not as much as I would like. Um, I was injury prone. I thought I was doing going to have the best season in the summer, uh, uh, the spring of 1992, and I actually pulled my hamstring. And um, I, I definitely wanted to compete at the highest level. Coach Moultrie is a great coach, moving me along, dropping times. But then after a while, you know, getting hurt and constantly being hurt, you're just like, wow, okay. Let me get this accounting thing going. But, you know, we made it to several big meets, um, Championship of America, the pen relays and some other things. But one can say I never really enjoyed what I wanted to get out of it. Mm -hmm. And um, 
I can't blame anybody for that. If your body is just not ready and can't do it, you just can't do it. So, but, Coach um, Moultrie, it sounds like he had a big influence on you. Um, yep. Can you just talk about you all's relationship and, and how that started? Yeah, Coach, my, my relationship started with him the first day I met him. When I came, went him to Drew Hall, when I told you I got off that taxi cab at Drew. That was the first day you met him? First day I met him. We've been talking on the phone. Never <laughs> met him before in my life. And um, matter of fact, in the book, if, if you're ever to get a copy of it, what we talk about in the book is how we met. I never met this man before, didn't know what he looked like. All I know is he told me, be ready. And in the lobby of Drew Hall at 5.30 p.m., I'm coming to get you and take you to a track and field meet. That and what's, was, uh, what's the name of the book? It's called It's Easy, Son. Quit Making Things Difficult. What's the I'll inspiration? What's, what's the inspiration it? behind that title? Um, that's him, Coach Moultrie. That's how he speaks. Everything is easy, son. Son, why are you making things so difficult? You know, life is not hard. You're the one making it hard. Mm -hmm. One plus one is always going to be equal to two, but you somehow you figured it out that one plus one must equal 12 or 13. It's not that hard, son. You're overthinking it. That's mm -hmm. how he would talk to us. Stuck with me this entire time. So I'm sitting there in the lobby of Drew Hall. He walks up. I don't know who he is. He goes to the receptionist. The only thing that I, I knew was his voice. And I sat and I remember him saying he was from Texas and he, he walked into the lobby of Drew Hall, cowboy boots, cowboy hat, walked up to the receptionist and said, hey, young lady, is a young man from Jamaica check in earlier? And she said, I think so. And he is like, you know, uh, he should have been meeting me down here at 530. The receptionist points to me sitting over in the corner said, I think that's him over there. And that's how we met. And literally when we met, he, I said, sir, thank you for the opportunity. And um, I'm glad to be here at the Mecca. And the, the quote I just gave you of the two things he told me to do, that's how he introduced himself. Those two things I want you to do, let's go to this track and field meeting. The rest is history. So you, so you okay, so you graduate Howard, accounting degree, class of? 1993. 1993, what, what, what's, what's your career look like at that point? What are your options? Well, fortunately enough, I had a job offer with Deloitte from my senior year. So in the fall of my senior year, of, of 90, fall of 92, I already had a job locked up with Deloitte and Touche. And um, that's where I went as a, right out of school. I went straight into the workforce. And that's a premier, a premier organization. So, you know, you go from the Mecca to Deloitte and Touche, is there any type of pressure you feeling or are you just ready to go get it? Oh, I'm ready to go get it. How would that prepared me well? That's what yeah. like I said to I think I said <laughs> yesterday on the phone, you don't go to Howard just to go to Howard. Yeah. You go to Howard because when you get out, a matter of fact, while you're at Howard, there's a mantle placed on you. Once you get through those gates or get off of Georgia Avenue and get on the sixth street, it's it's a wrap. You mm -hmm. are supposed to be delivering from there on out. And um, Howard University prepared me well. And I got in there and um, I just wanted to prove myself. I wanted to show that I was worthy of the position and, and the trust that Deloitte had put in me. And I got there and just wanted to start and get at it. So what, what type of work are you doing at Deloitte? I was a public accountant, um, working my way towards my CPA. And when you're at Deloitte, you go through several industries that you, you know, to try to find your niche. So while going through Deloitte, I specialized in what's called independent power plants. As fate would have it, I, I bumped into a partner. His name is Christopher Nichols. He was from the, he is British. And we formed a bond over the sport of cricket. Mm. So then he would take me onto the engagements he, were, he was on. So I was, uh, some of my clients were very large multinational independent power plants, AES and Ogden and companies like that. So I, I also was responsible for nonprofit organizations. And um, quite honestly, that nonprofit organization, that experience and background in dealing with nonprofits led me to out of public accounting in when I became the uh, corporate controller for the United Negro College Fund. So that was my wow. natural progression from Deloitte and Touche to the United Negro College Fund. What now what how, how, how far after you go to Deloitte do you go to the uh, United Negro College Fund? I spent five years at Deloitte. I spent wow, so five, year, 
Hired While you were at Deloitte, you become a CPA, right? Yep. I became a certified public accountant and um, just continued to. So what is that? I mean, you, you know, United Negro College Fund, that's like, you know, a nonprofit that has helped so many people, uh, you know, like me and you, you know, uh, be able to afford college. And here you are, you know, you're still in your 20s. And you're a controller for such an organization that has such a huge, huge responsibility. What, like what, um, what's going through your mind at this point, you know, when you land a role like that? Well, it's, once again, the Howard preparation, just go get it. And I'm a, I'm a, you might have read from my bio, I'm a very spiritual person. I, I'm a seminary graduate as well. And um, when I got to the United Negro College Fund, like everything else, I, I never interviewed for it. Mm. A number of the moves that I've made, I've never interviewed for. I was handpicked. And William H. Gray III um, saw me one Saturday morning working in the audit room. And he said to me, said to the then CFO at UNCF, can we get this young man to come and join us at UNCF to help us with some of the things we're trying to do? That's how I got to UNCF. They created a position for me to leave Deloitte and join the United Negro College Fund um, just to start a transitioning of leadership in that regard. New ticketing platform that values event organizers so much more, eventnoir.com. Event Noir is the perfect ticketing technology for your events that rewards event organizers by helping them make extra money for each ticket sale they make. This platform truly allows event organizers to benefit from their own influence and hard work. Founded by veteran event organizers, Event Noir reinvests ticketing fees into its organizers that continuously use the platform and also enables its users with pricing power to adjust their rate for ticketing fees. But wait, there's more! Besides providing an easy process to set up events in a few steps and for attendees to browse for events and purchase tickets, Event Noir also features a variety of custom templates to create an event page, enhance ticketing and attendee management tools, and even includes the option to add live streaming events and more. Don't wait any longer. Get started today with Event Noir, the perfect ticketing partner for your events. That's huge. I mean, yep. so, and, and like you just alluded to, you know, you're a very spiritual man, um, rooted in uh, Christianity. Can you, can you talk about some of the works that you've done outside of your professional career? Well, outside of my professional career, I try to do a lot with young people. I, I mentor quite a bit of young people. My wife and I, when we were living in Charlotte, North Carolina, we, we attended the Park Church under the leadership of Bishop Claude Richard Alexander, and uh, we team taught Bible study to teenagers. Mm -hmm. um, so we had the high school groups, and invariably today, just watching them grow and develop and go on with their own lives, that is a blessing in and of itself. I also coached. I coached all of my children throughout all of their athletic careers. All three of my children are athletes, um, soccer, swimming, track and field, um, and they were fairly good at it. Um, my Eldest son was a soccer player, played, played varsity all throughout. My second son is a swimmer and track athlete, has been varsity throughout. He's now in college as well hmm. and was just recently named co-captain of his team. And my daughter is a soccer and track and field person, and she's getting ready to head to college this fall. Oh, so they get it from their pops. Well, their, their mom is a former athlete as well. So oh, really? We're what, just blessed, I guess. We're just blessed in that regard. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, you got the financial model figured out. Might as well. Uh, did, 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 did they get free college? No, they didn't. Get, well, for one year, they did get free college. My eldest okay. came to me at, uh, at Ithaca College, didn't make it to Howard. Uh, uh, ended up at Howard, but wanted to look at some other options. He's now at Howard in grad school. Okay. But, um, yeah, I, I wanted him to at least experience the Mecca. So he's there in grad school now. Um, but so at, at what point did you get married? I, I think we skipped over that part. Oh, I got married in 1994. So my wife and I are going to be married 26 years this, um, this June. June will be 26 years in marriage. So, so was this why you, are you still at uh, UNCF? I still at UNCF at this. No, I think we're at Deloitte at that time. So I have a, married. I have a question about that. You know, a lot of people that I've been interviewing, a lot of people that are very successful, they, they're married. And, you know, um, 
you're a man of faith and I, I want to ask you, you know, about the importance of choosing a mate, yeah. you know, can you talk about how, why that's important or why you think it's, imp you know, what that process is and how you, why you think, um, or, or, or do you think choosing a mate, how does that contribute to maybe lifelong success and decision making? Right. I, I, first thing I'll say, I don't think, I will say this up front, I don't think marriage is for everybody mm -hmm. because you have to have a certain level of maturity and a certain level of emotional intelligence and what we call an EQ, emotional quotient. I tell a lot of people who will ask me, how, how, long, how did Sharon and I get married so young? My wife's name is Sharon Kay. How did we get married so young and still look like we're happy? <laughs> um, my response to that is usually that, first of all, you got to, the person got to be your friend. If you don't want to be around the person, that's, that's the biggest challenge that folks have. The second thing is, you, when you get married and you're going through that process, you can't live a single life in a marriage. Mm -hmm. And I've seen a lot of people who want to still act as they would if they were single inside the marriage. That does not work. From a spiritual perspective, you know, a marriage is ordained by God. And you stand up in that church and you stand before those people and you take those vows. But you don't go into it lightly because when you step into the church and make those vows, it's not that you're married. You're just starting a partnership that you are going to want to have to last. And while you're going along in that partnership, you're making joint decisions together. Do we want to have children? Okay, yes. How many? But if I can't understand who you are and what your likes and dislikes are, it's going to be tough being married. Like right now, we're on lockdown with COVID-19. One of the most interesting things that I have seen in the media and people complaining about are spouses who are mad at each other. And they didn't know that these things, <laughs> I didn't know he was like that. I didn't know she was like that. I'm like, but those are things you should have known before you even went this route. So we, we were dating um, my first semester of the sophomore year at Howard. Wow. I met her at the punch out. I heard the punch out. Punch out. And I told her, I said, look, you know, being all bragging, you know how Howard Bison men are, right? <laughs> yeah. I told her, I said, look, you know, you're going to be my wife. You're going to be my girl. She's like, yeah, whatever. And here we are, almost 30 years total together. So wow, that's it's, amazing. It's, it's how you want to live this thing and understanding that when you make this vow and commitment, you're not only making this vow and commitment to each other, you're making this vow and commitment to God. And if God is in the middle of that union, what you find over time is, your union also becomes a testimony to others. So I know that, you know, you were at uh, UNCF for quite some time, but then after that, you went to Johnson C. Smith University, right? Yes, I did. Yeah, you went to Johnson C. Smith and you started to establish, I guess, you know, you started to kind of change things. Yeah. And, you know, from yeah. what I read about you, you, you put in, uh, you, you implemented programs that did not previously uh, exist, like Financial First, I think you would establish the college's first ever unrestricted cash reserve. Yep. Was it, was it tough uh, going into a system like that? You know, you're the new guy, you know, going in setting up a new system. Uh, did you have any pushback? Not at all. Not at no. all. Dorothy Kowser Yancey. Um, that's the lady who I admire and cherish. And I told someone last week, nobody better say anything bad about Dr. Yancey around me. She saw what I was doing at, John, at the United Negro College Fund. That was right after we established the Gates Millennium Scholars Program, mm -hmm. which was the $1 billion program, which is still in existence today. I still think that is, when people ask me what's the proudest moment, that's the thing I point to the most because we had to establish that program and set up the financial framework in two weeks. And Bill Gray allowed me to do that. $1 billion to serve 20,000 students. So. After Bill Gray retired, she saw what I was doing and she said, would you come down to Johnson C. Smith and be my CFO? Wow. So I told her, yes, I would. At first I told her no. I told her no because I was at UNCF and I was, you know, 
in my late 20s, early 30s, that's when pride and ego gets in the way. You know, we had offices all across the country. I could fly to offices and spend time in cities. And, you know, I was the corporate controller for this big organization. And now you're asking me to become a CFO for a tiny school. But secondly, ignorance is bliss, as I said at the start. I said to uh, Mr. Gray, I said, Mr. Gray, but North Carolina, that's KKK country. I'm not going down there. Um, he said, I called Bill Gray up and I said, Mr. Gray, you know, Dr. Yancey's asking me to come down. What do you think? He said to me, you'd be a fool not to go. Really? Someone's offering you a job to be the CFO in your early 30s. You better take it and run with it. And Dr. Yancey is, I consider her to be one of the best higher education administrators, bar none. Wow. Of all the institutions that I have been, both Ivy League, Cornell, uh, wealthy Ithaca College as their CFO and Vice President of Finance, Dr. Yancey as a president is they, no one pretty much, she ranks right up there with them. So how, so are, these, was, how are these people finding you and how are you establishing a brand that allows people to say, you know what, a job is open and we're not even on, <laughs> we're going to go find the person and it's going to be Gerald. That's who we want. We want him. Like what, how are you establishing these relationships? How are you building this brand? You know, because most people, when they want a new job, they got to go interview for it. It right. sounds like you, your reputation kind of preceded yourself. It, 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 like I said, the grace of God. <laughs> you know, we're going to go back to the bison. <laughs> Howard University prepares you for what needs to be done. So if you're in there, you don't go to Howard just to go to Howard. You have a mantle that is placed upon you. So whatever situation you find yourself in, you have to deliver. That's what I talk about in the book as well. You At what point deliver. did you drop this book? When did you write the book? I wrote the book in October. It released October of last year. And it's okay. doing okay. very well. And I'm surprised. But the target audience is actually the ones that are gravitating towards it. Oh, good. Young professionals and young people wanting to figure out what's next. Wow. So Dr. Yancey, she brought me in. She gave me a two-word instruction. She said, Gerald, fix it. She went off to be one of the most prolific fundraisers in Johnson C. Smith's history. And myself and another young vice president, wasn't vice president at the time, but another young man by the name of Jeffrey Smith. She brought us. She mentored us. She showed us the ropes. When I was mm -hmm. making mistakes, she would say, you're messing up. That's not how we do it here. I know you're bright and everything else, but higher education is a different animal. So she mentored me throughout the whole way. And those first that we did was with her blessing. Uh, she said, Gerald, I want to leave a legacy here at Johnson C. Smith. So we sat down, we re re reconfigured the budget. We reconfigured almost everything that we had to do and we got it done. And we left, before she left, she left Johnson C. Smith with, a $10.2 million unrestricted cash reserve, the largest and the first in the school's history. So why, why do you base on your experience? Why, I mean, you, you hear horror stories about how black colleges manage money. Yeah. You know, is that just a, something that's true or is it something that's just a fictional tale that just kind of caught steam? It's, it's, I'll put it to you this way. It's a balance. You got to have a balance. You got our institutions, our HBCUs, are gems. They have to be protected. They have to be nurtured, and they have to be supported. Any organization, and what we have done over the years is demonize what happens at these institutions. But you got to also remember something. Why they were founded, how they were founded, and what they're still fighting for. So... When you see people say, well, you know, how they manage the money, you, you're still trying to get to a place where you are actually on a level playing field, and the playing field is still not level, right? Mm -hmm. When you look at the demographics of the nation today and you ask yourself, can I afford to go get the best talent in these areas? The answer is probably no, because you cannot afford it. But you're trying to still maintain these organizations they've been around for 150 plus years and that's why i always push back on folks that say well you know hbcu this hbcu that now i spent uh seven years in upstate new york with two very wealthy institutions 
And I can tell you, they still, they have challenges as well. Mm -hmm. But for some reason, our HBCU challenges get exacerbated. And then people once again, just start saying, you know what, I can't do this. And I think that is a narrative that has stuck with us. And quite honestly, people ask me, when I left Cornell, I was the vice president of financial affairs and the university treasurer, very large institution, a $4.3 billion annual budget. And they say, well, why are you at Morehouse? When I was transitioning back to the South, my parents were ill, but I was interviewing for the executive vice president role at Georgia Tech, University of Florida, George Mason, made it to the top two in those searches, but it was tough because I never, I never had a public uh, university background. But just the mere fact that those folks would take an interest in me and I got all the way to the final rounds tells you something. But I sit there and I said to myself, well, the Morehouse opportunity came around because we have a new president in Dr. David Thomas and just the Morehouse brand and legacy. So I'm here at Morehouse, back in the HBCU fold, trying to um, maintain this legacy of this institution, but more importantly, allow for this legacy to be extended so more young brothers can walk through these halls and be blessed by the, the Morehouse experience. I mean, what are, what are some uh, challenges that face uh, uh, HBCU that maybe it may not face a school like Cornell that got billions of dollars and, you know, alumni that, you know, can, can afford, that has discretionary income to give a lot of money? What... Right. Cause a lot of time we just see, you know, we come back to how we like, man, this building still ain't fixed or this right. is still this right. way. You know, right. why don't they address this? You know, like one thing that, well, you can answer that question. And I have a, another question. Um, in, in 2014, I wrote a white paper, um, for the Southern education foundation. It's called, um, uh, I, I can't, I, the name will come back to me, but it's getting a lot of attention again. I wrote it about HBCUs and minority serving institutions. The reason why I wrote it is because I had just left Johnson C. Smith and I had gone to Ithaca College. And I was invited back to a meeting of HBCU presidents down in Atlanta, Georgia. And I was sitting in the room listening to the president speak and I'm saying, I was saying to myself, but the issues you guys are talking about is not what plagues our HBCUs right now. now I was no longer in the HBCU world. So this gentleman said to me, will you write a piece on this particular issue? And I did. And um, it gets a lot of play. Here are the, here's the crux of the issue for HBCUs and minority serving institutions today. Aside from the fact that we historically have been underfunded and underserved, the current challenge that we have is that we have to discount our tuition so high in order for students to attend that our cash flow is not where it should be. Let me give you an example. The national average for private institutions discount rate, meaning that people will say, well, Howard costs $40,000. I'm making up a number. But if I'm discounting at 50%, right, that student is probably not going to pay $40,000, right? Mm -hmm. But what happens is it's what we call unfunded discount meaning that we get no cash into the institution. So the reason why you don't see buildings and so on being fixed is you need cash. And then our alumni, as you alluded to, they don't have a lot of discretionary money to contribute in the millions of dollars like other institutions can. So I just left a very wealthy institution and it's not uncommon to see, um, you know, regular people you see walking by write a check for a million dollars. Really? You're not getting alumni at Howard to be doing that in, in Moss. So when we think about it that way, we need to come home to our HBCUs. So by the year 2027, it is positive that black and brown students will become the majority students on college campuses all across America. But the data also says they are the same students who can't afford it. So here's the problem, or here is the tension. The wealthy schools, they also see this information, that the pipeline of students is going to be primarily black and brown. So I'm going to go get the brightest, and I'm going to buy them. Hmm. We can't buy them. We don't have the money, right? Mm -hmm. So as the shift is occurring, 
our HBCUs are having to give more and more aid to allow those students who are bright to still attend our institutions. Howard, Spelman, Morehouse, Hampton, all of those brand name HBCUs, so to speak, I don't mean to diss any one of them, but they will always have a draw because of the name, the reputation, the gravitas, but the issue is still the same. You're drawing from the same pool of uh, students that are coming through the pipeline that are having these financial challenges. I have no doubt in my mind that under Dr. Frederick's leadership, Howard University is going to just see this, this period in time with the buildings and all these things. And five years, six years from now, we'll probably be singing a different tune. So what about, you know, like when I was at Howard, and, and, and I'm sure every alum who probably attended Howard prior to like 2000, they come back now and Northwest looks totally different. Right. And so a question people say, well, how come Howard doesn't own a lot of these properties around the area? Like I'm in Chicago and in Chicago, like University of Chicago, they own like everything. So they kind of control like the value of real estate. Mm -hmm. is, it, is it just as simple as getting in the game or, or was it more complicated than that? You know, how come a school like Howard that's in a major city how come they don't take advantage of real estate? I guess it's too late now, but I was just so surprised that they just didn't own a lot of land and property around there. Yeah, you got to have money to buy land. <laughs> and you got to have the equity and you got to have the balance sheet strength to make those moves, right? Mm -hmm. I'll give you a personal story. When I graduated Howard in 1993, every time I go to D.C. today, I kick myself. I want to just stand up and start crying and bawling my eyes out. What, why? When I graduated, there were crack houses all along 9th and T, you name it, going down those, where U Street so nicely developed now, you go mm -hmm. down, you know, certain parts of 14th Street, 13th Street, 6th Street, 7th Street, dilapidated buildings. They were trying to get rid of them because of blight and people being out there drinking and all kinds of stuff. The estimate that they gave us, you know, each one of those shells, you could have probably got for like $15,000, $20,000, right? You graduate college. When I graduated Howard, I had nothing. I knew I had a job. I had to go get a car for my job. So I'm starting to look at life. I don't have disposable income. So I couldn't participate. I couldn't buy any. I couldn't do any of that. But what about Howard as an institution? How come same, they didn't same, same metaphorical thing is what I'm, I'm using myself as a metaphor. Now, when I go back to those same homes, yeah, 600,000, mm -hmm. just think if back then before this turn was happening, if we had that type of disposable income at Howard in order to invest in that way. So when you get to Cornell, you know, obviously that's a Ivy League school, $4.5 billion budget, you know, um, what is that environment like where, I would think you probably have access to a lot more resources. Um, you know, what, what, what is it like when you get to a school like Cornell? Because it seems like you, you know, you're excelling in your career, you know, chief financial officer at age 31. And you're, sounds like you're making a conscious decision to stay in like the higher education nonprofit realm. But yeah, you have the ability, like if you want, you can go work for, you know, Fortune 500 company and probably make double, you know, what you're making. What is it like to go to a, a place like Cornell and what goes into your decision making when you make your next move? Well, for me, it's really about what's on my heart. Mm -hmm. So I, I tell a lot of the young people that I interact with is you never want to get in a position where you get a blessing and you get the blessing, but you, you give up on your promise, okay? And I'm always looking for what's next. Um, Cornell, it was a good experience for me, three years, but you know, being seven years in upstate New York, my wife and I are both from Jamaica. <laughs> um, culturally, when I went to Cornell, I, I, I came out of the C-suite, went one level down to have that experience. But I want to be in a way that I can give back. I want to be able to give back. I have been blessed tremendously. And how could I give back where I could be right at where the action is? 
So and did you feel like a did you feel like a void when you were there? Oh no, no. At Cornell, I had great friends, great colleagues. Um, I learned a lot when I was there. Uh, Cornell built. We built a campus in Manhattan called Cornell Tech. Um, if you ever ever been in, go to Manhattan now, Roosevelt Island, uh, Cornell now has a campus built from the ground up. Um, was glad to see that happen. Learned a lot about that. We built quite a number of buildings that we commissioned while I was there. Same thing at Ithaca College in terms of the experiences. So what I told one of my, my mentees the other day is, I spent so much time in HBCU matters, Howard grad, UNCF, Johnson C. Smith, for almost a decade. I got a chance to go up to the Northeast and um, learn. And while I was there, finish up my seminary degree, so I'm back now down in the South and I'm at Morehouse. And what I want to do is to continue to give. And quite honestly, it is much more rewarding when I can see the fruit of my work directly mm -hmm. and um, enjoying myself here at Morehouse. I'll be here uh, next week, Wednesday. I'll be here one year. Oh, wow. It's, okay. It's been a great one year thus far. So when you're, when you're interviewing or being vetted for these institutions that, and, and you was seemingly a very high profile position or if not high profile, you have a ton of responsibility. What, what kind of questions are they asking you in these interviews to make sure that you're the right person? Well, a lot of what people will ask about today is one, your record will speak for itself. Your record of accomplishment will speak for itself. Um, if you're someone who delivers, people will see that you, 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 you are your best um, marketing billboard, so to speak. So if you're delivering, that's one. Now, what I will say to you is I see so many young people who literally, they are so focused on the technical aspects of the job, which they must have, right? One, but they don't network. Mm -hmm. They don't volunteer. They don't do anything pro bono. They will say, well, you know, I, you got to pay me for that. Well, if you don't pay <laughs> for that, nobody's going to see you because not everybody can pay you. And I will say the things that have given me the most reward and the emails that I will get and telephone calls that I will get are people who will call and just ask me for my, for my opinion on a topic. That's it, simply. But you find people are so driven to rise the ladder that they forget that while they're rising, they can pull somebody along or just bring somebody in at their level. And that kind of selfishness is self-defeating because you will have a moniker tagged to you that you're not a team player, you're just about yourself. So everywhere that I've been, I have tried to leave it better than I found it. So even though I'm the chief financial officer, I became very involved in race relation issues. Hmm. So if you remember the fall of 2015 when they had the Missouri incidents, yes, and all across the nation, schools were losing it and you know race just bomb in your face. I was living in upstate New York, Ithaca College, 2015, the fall, the only black vice president or vice president of color on the leadership team. And I'm looking at what's happening. I'm trying to talk to the students. They're telling me, we don't want to talk to you because you're part of the administration. That's fine. That's their right. But at the same time, I had to go inside myself and sometimes step outside and say, Gerald, you're a Administrator, yes, but you're a person of color living in a city right now that's hurting. And it's hurting because there is one, a lack of familiarity and an ignorance as to what the race is, how they mix. So I found myself now as a chief financial officer dealing heavily with race issues. And just this past week or two weeks ago, I was named to the National Association of College and University Business Officers their advisory board on leadership diversity in higher education. Oh, congratulations. That's that awesome. has nothing to do with accounting and finance, mm -hmm. but it is becoming a big thing in accounting and finance. So it's when you volunteer and you want to lead rather than just simply being there, just being in the number. And that's well, what I try to encourage young people to do every day. So I'm, I, I see just, you know, a lot of, just from doing my research on you and hearing you speak, um, Diversity and inclusion is something that's very, it means a lot to you. What, you know, what is, when I, when I say those words, you know, what, what does diversity and inclusion mean to you? Because to, to be quite honest, 
you hear those words and some people say, well, you know, diversity doesn't mean, you know, like so, some companies will say diversity, but at the same time, they, they might mean, okay, we're going to bring in more women or more white women. You uh -huh. know, we're going to bring in more gays. And, yeah. you know, and, and this is not necessarily my opinion, but these are just in, in conversations that I'm exposed to. It, it feels like sometimes um, black people are kind of used as the, like, you know, as like a symbol of diversity and inclusion, but then it doesn't really like benefit us the way that we want it to. It kind of end up benefiting other groups, you know? Yeah. So can you yeah. just talk to me about diversity and inclusion and, and what that means to you? Well, the term diversity and inclusion now is a very broad category. It includes mm -hmm. all of the above that you just mentioned, right? So if you want to look at it from the standpoint of a race diversity, that's one lens. Um, gender is another. Um, sexual preference is another, et cetera, et cetera. For us as black people or people of color, we are always looking for how are we going to get, um, I, I want to say, recompensed in some ways for what we endured being in this country or being what our ancestors um, had, had addressed. That's, that's still real. Mm -hmm. At the same time, there's a diversity that's happening across all the spectrums that you mentioned. And if you're going to be a business or an organization, you have to acknowledge all of them. Mm -hmm. That is where the tension is coming, equal pay. So you asked me about marriage. My, I'm married to a very bright two-time Howard graduate computer systems engineer. Glass ceiling is still an issue. I have a daughter who is getting ready to study chemical engineering. Same issue. So people look at me and say, how do you see it? Well, I live with two, right? So I look at that in that broadest scope of how it's defined. Now, when mm -hmm. you ask me as a father and a husband, I am saying to myself, I need for people of color now to realize we, we're here. It's, not, it's, it's going to get to a point where you can't ignore it because the society is changing. And the rate at which diversity is occurring in terms of race, it is going to hit in such a way that you cannot ignore it. Because, you know, right I, I ask that because I, I run the Howard Alumni Instagram, and I remember uh -huh. we hired David Bennett. I don't know if you know him. He's an uh, he's he's institution of advancement. Yeah, he's like the um, vice president of alumni yeah. development. Okay. And so I, you know, I repost a lot of stuff, and it was right. a lot of, it was like split, you know. Right. Like, obviously, he's a white guy at Howard. And I think at the time it was some financial stuff that was reported. So now you brought him in and the optics of it, it rubbed people the wrong way. Mm. But of course, from a business standpoint, you do want to have mm. the most qualified person to come in and fix mm. whatever needs mm. to be fixed. So just, and, and like you said earlier, we want to preserve HBCUs as, as much as possible. Right. And a part of that is putting black people in those type of positions but at the same time, we don't want to shoot ourselves in the foot by just putting somebody black that may not be as qualified as somebody else. Right. So, you know, I just asked that question just to get your thoughts on it. Well, you, you kind of hit the nail on the head. It's competency. That's the number one thing. That's what's going to keep these institutions there. But what sometimes rubs me the wrong way is that we can't, um, people will say, well, you know, you can't find them. Yes, you can. But here's the challenge. Goes back to what I said earlier. If you are not producing at a level where people are seeing you and they, they know of your work, in higher education, for example, to get tenure and things like that, you got to publish, you got to write articles, you got to do all these kinds of things. What I tell most people who want to be CBOs today, because I mentor a number of CBOs, right? You have to be a well rounded CFO. There's an article that's coming out probably in July. I'll, I'll make sure to share it with you that I was co-collaborator on for Nakubo. And we were talking about the things, what is the future CBO going to look like? They look nothing like what we thought they were five to 10 years ago. So if I want to be in the C-suite, I have to get skills and be rounded enough to take on that job. Yes, then I'm there doing it. 
and I'm being mentored. I'm seeking out mentors. I'm looking for people who would advocate for me. So when the time comes and I know I'm qualified and I step up and my resume hits that table, there is no doubt that, you know, okay, he's the one. Definitely. You know, I appreciate you sharing that very thoughtful answer. Um, so, uh, you know, you, you, you leave Cornell and now you're headed to Morehouse. That, that Robert Smith relationship, was that a part of you from being at Cornell? Did you help no. facilitate? Okay, okay. <laughs> no, it was not. Literally, funny story. I started Morehouse on March the 13th. He made his announcement on March the 17th. I wasn't there for the announcement because my eldest son was graduating that same day in Ithaca, New York. Okay. So I am in Ithaca, New York, and at about three o'clock in the afternoon, my my phone starts buzzing. They're like, you're not going to believe what happened. You're not going to believe what happened. I know you just got here, but I'm like, what are y'all talking about? He said, turn on the news. And I turned on the news and he said, I'm covering all of these loans for these students. And I was like, wow. Now, when I was at Cornell, um, Mr. Smith is a Cornell grad. I don't know if you knew that. Yeah, that's why I brought that up. Yeah, yeah. So when I was there, he gave a gift to rename the um, engineering school. So the engineering school is renamed after him now um, up at Cornell. But I was there when he, he gave that, that gift as well. So oh, nice. one of my friends said to me, um, you know, wherever you go, money seems to follow you. So I was at <laughs> UNCF. When I got to UNCF within two, two years. A billion dollars. Bill, Bill Gates. <laughs> Bill Gray comes in and said, you know, Gerald, Bill Gates is going to give us a billion dollars. You know, now just think about that for a minute. Someone says, I'm going to give you a billion dollars to establish a first of its kind program. Your reaction is going to be, yeah, right. Whatever. Yeah, that's crazy. But never doubt the people that are leading you. Bill Gray, Dorothy Yancey, people like that, when they speak, oh, they're going to get it done. Mm -hmm. They're going to get it done. So I go there, Johnson C. Smith, gifts roll in. We set up this, this um, $10 million um cache for the next president to come in and receive ithaca college we go there we work working on another big donation i go to cornell and you know that came over there and then i got to morehouse that came there so my wife says to me she said your life is what dr yancey told you to do you're a fix-it man and um i have embraced that and i enjoy it so so why why go to morehouse you know you're at cornell I'm not saying that was an easy gig, but I think, you know, it goes without saying that you got more resources at, at, at a school like Cornell. You probably could ride off into the sunset. And if you wanted, you probably could have went into the public sector, made more money. Why go to a, a smaller institution like Morehouse? Although, it, you know, it, it's, it's definitely something that's an institution that, you know, is a staple in the black community and, you know, the black diaspora at large. But why, why go to Morehouse? Um, when I was being asked to, to take this role at Morehouse, I was being recruited by others as well. But my wife said to me, we're from Jamaica. We, you know, once again, you're married. You don't make decisions by yourself. You, mm -hmm. you can if you want to. <laughs> so, you know, we had some ground rules. It has to be warm. It has to be, um, demographically diverse. And it has to have a major metropolitan airport. Mm -hmm. Ithaca, where we have been for the last seven years, has a regional airport. For me to get to a nice mall or something like that, I got to drive to Syracuse. So we have lived that. Imagine that, living in D.C., big city, then moving to Charlotte, big city, seven years in upstate New York. I was telling her this morning, remember I told you I'm spiritual, right? Yes, sir. So seven years, that's completion. <laughs> it's time to go. So that was um, in the back of our mind. There, there were institutions that were still in the Northeast and they were in very, very cold places, but we wanted to be back in the warm. Plus I needed to be in the South because I had um, two ill parents. So two weeks after me taking the job at Morehouse and one of the reasons for me coming back South, my mom passed away. Oh, my so, condolences to you. Yeah. So, you know, it's one of those things. And um, dad is still down here in the South. So being in the South, I, I think this is where we want to be for some time. So all of those things, then the history of Morehouse, uh, Dr. David Thomas being the new president there, um, used to be a very well-accomplished individual, Harvard Business School professor, uh, Yale graduate, mm. Georgetown Business School. 
So if I could connect with him and we can try to help him to build out a team and just the entire vibe of Morehouse and Atlanta, it just felt like a good fit for us. And so far after this first year, I, I have not regretted coming here. It's not, it's a lot of work because I'm back in, as you said, I'm back into an environment where I don't have as much resources as I did elsewhere. But um, that's the, the thing now that gets to me wanting to give back. And, um, I, you know, people still call me all the time and say, why are you staying at a school so small, da, 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 job offers and so on, you know, recruiters and so on. But I, I intend to stay here for some time. That is my goal as long as the board and the president will have me here. Awesome. So can you summarize, you know, um, talk about your book, It's Easy Son, Quit Making Things Difficult. You know, mm-hmm. for, for people that may see this that want to pick it up, you know, just talk about the inspiration and, and what people can expect to, to, to learn about you and, 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 and whatever else they can expect to learn if they were to read that book. Well, it's, there's a copy of it here. I don't know if you guys can see it. Mm-hmm. It's on Amazon, uh, Gerald Hector, uh, or you can go to GeraldHector.com. But I wrote this book because when I was coming up uh, in my career, I was always an advocate for the student. Regardless of where I was, they would always ask me, Mr. Hector, you know, when I was at Johnson C. Smith, I brought, I was responsible for bringing Lennox Graham, the, the world um, Olympian coach, and brought him to Johnson C. Smith, and he coached Olympians and a world champion in Daniel Williams. So I've always been connected to the students. But invariably, even when I was at Johnson C. Smith, they would ask me, how did you get to be a CFO so young? I got that all the time. When I got to Ithaca College, a a traditional white institution, I was getting the same thing. When I got to Cornell, I even served as one of the judiciary officers and having different students coming through, they would always ask me, you know, how did you get here? So I would always tell them that I had several coaches in my life growing up in Jamaica, George Thompson, Roy McLean. And then I always talked about Coach Moultrie and I tied it to the Howard University experience. So this book is really about my time at Howard and how stories and anecdotes of what Coach Moultrie said. He always had these words that he used, you know, you know, Henrietta and Big Bubba, stay away from him, you know, um, <laughs> small juice, small man, big juice, big man, you know, some days you're the bug, some days you're the windshield. Every one of his sayings, we used to say, this man is crazy. But now that I'm older, I just turned 50 in September, and I meet with my classmates and track and field teammates from eras back, and you see them as doctors, lawyers, scientists, CEOs. They'll say to you, you know, we thought Coach was crazy, but he had something, he was right. He was really preparing us for life. Howard University was his incubator for developing young, black, gifted, entrepreneurial individuals track and field just so happened to be his vehicle of choice Mm. so what i tried to do here is meld my personal experiences at howard alongside the advice coach moultrie gave me and how it has helped me in my career thus far so whatever the next chapter holds for me coach moultrie is no longer with us but um his voice he sits right here on my right shoulder and I listen to his words day in and day out. So whatever I choose to do next, just like you having me on your podcast, this book is now spawned a podcast because um, believe it or not, I just did a presentation at an accounting conference. So I'm starting my own podcast. I have my guests lined up. Awesome. Um, and, and my first guest is gonna be a Howard alum. I can't give it away yet, but he's one of Howard's, Howard's son, very successful Jamaican businessman. And um, we're just going to talk about the Mecca and how did he leave Howard and end up in Harvard Business School and made his way to owning what he owns today. If I say what he owns, I'm going to give it away. But um, when when can we how can we listen to your podcast that um, we're hoping to have it the first one out. We're working with a musician now to get the jingle right and all those kinds of things. So I'm trying to do it very once again. The Mecca prepares you, so you got to yeah, do it right. Absolutely. So we're trying to make sure we do it uh, first class. So probably in, in the mid-June time frame will be the first one. 
And then we have some N uh, an NFL great who is a good friend of mine over the years. Um, and the lineup has just been great. And a lot of the folks are from people that I have met over the course of my career who have helped me and who have also met in business as well. Nice. Nice. That's awesome. I can't wait till it comes out. You know, I had uh, a guest uh, Friday or no, I'm sorry, Thursday. Do you know Lance Gross, the actor? I know of him. I don't, I've never met him yeah, personally. I think he ran track at Howard too. So I had him yeah. on the show and I, and I want to say that Moultrie might've coached him too. Oh, really? I think when, when did uh, he pass? Uh, coach passed. Uh, what are we now? I want to say 2000. 14? Yeah, yeah so Lance, Lance was at Howard when I was there, so from 2000 to 2004. And I, I remember when he was saying that Coach, uh, he, he was like RIP to Coach, I, I forgot the name, but I'm assuming that's the same person. Oh, it's probably the same person, yeah. And he also said that he had a big impact on his life as well. So, yeah. so it's just ironic that you both would, you know, talk about that, talk about him in that regard. I think it says a lot about his character and, yeah. you know, his teachings. So around this time is when I kind of wrap up and I'll, you know, I always ask, you know, this closing question. Um, well, first, number one question I do want to ask, well, three, three questions I want to ask. Number one, um, what does, you know, Gerald right now say to the, the, the Geralds of the world that are entering Howard's and the more houses, you know, right now, you know, the 18 year olds, what, what, what are you saying to those guys, especially to the, the international guys that are coming yeah. in here? foreign land you know you look black you open your mouth you know you're jamaican you caribbean you know yeah. what, what what advice are you giving to these individuals as they come yeah. into these universities i'll start with the internationals i'll give you a good story what coach told me and i think i pass it on as many times i can to the internationals i was going through i couldn't understand something about race relations when i got here because i'm from jamaica and jamaica is predominantly black and he said to me son you have three strikes against you First, you're black. Second, you're a foreigner. And third, you're bright. And then he asked me, so what are those? Stumbling blocks or stepping stones? And walked off. Whenever that comes up in your mind, there are stepping stones. And in this world and in this life, we're all going to make mistakes. I stopped using the word mistakes. I, call it, I, steal, I stole a word I saw on a meme recently that resonate with me. I call them must takes. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to fail. But when you fail, just get up, learn from it, and never have it happen again. It's never a mistake if you learn from it. And I'll also say, just like Coach told me, if you're just entering Morehouse or Spellman, Howard, Hampton, whatever it is, whatever institution it is, sacrifice four years of your life for the rest of your life. If you can maintain that focus, yeah, you can have your partying and so on and so forth, but never forget why you came to Howard University. You don't just come to Howard University to go to Howard University. Once you get on 6th Street, you have a mantle that's placed on you that is more than simply becoming a college graduate. You have to become a social entrepreneur to drive change. International, U.S. based citizen, whatever it is, you leave Howard University with the mindset that you're going to make an impact on the world. Nice. Nice, man. Thank you for sharing that. I think that might be a teaser for this interview. Next, I want to know, you know, what, what are some things that you want to accomplish in the future? Right. Well, I am being asked by a number of people. I'll, I'll probably be headed back to school um, to get my terminal degree. I'm just trying to find the time and how to get that done. A good bison brother of ours, uh, Charles Gibbs, who was a football player uh, at Howard while I was there, texted me yesterday. He just uh, successfully defended his dissertation. So he's now Dr. Gibbs, Dr. Charles Gibbs, three-time graduate of Howard University. So I said to him, I got to lean on you a little bit, my brother. And why am I doing this terminal degree? Um, once again, people see things in you before you see it in yourself. I have no desire. Uh, five, six, seven, eight years ago to say I want to be a college president. Being a college president, you, that's a calling. You don't just want to be a college president. You've got to be called to be one because the institution becomes your, your second spouse, so to speak. But um, I'm being asked to do that. So that's the next thing on the horizon for me is going back to school and getting that terminal degree. And um, other than that, enjoying my wife and 
empty nesting with my kids and continuing to guide them along the way and playing a lot more golf. I have not played as much golf as, as I want to. I now live in Atlanta and oh my God, golf courses are everywhere. So I have no excuse now. So those are the things I plan to do. Just have a simple life. And I am going to write, I'm going to continue writing um, my blog at GeraldHector.com. I just started that. I only have two entries there, but I hope to write some more because writing relaxes me. And um, give back wherever I can. Um, give advice, counsel. Um, I, I help some presidents in terms of thinking through things that they're doing, my fellow CFO colleagues, and sharing in that regard. So giving back is the name of the game for me going forward. Awesome. Awesome. And uh, what, you know, last question, what do you want your legacy to be? Um, that, you know, if someone he hears my name, at least he gave it an honest effort, whatever that honest effort was. Um, I'm a very simple person. Um, don't need any fanfare and all kinds of stuff. Uh, my legacy is, you know, that he tried to make a difference. And like folks will say to me, everywhere that you've been, you've left it better than you found it. Um, I, that's how, I, wh wherever I leave, I want to have that kind of to follow me. But I'll say it this way, you know, there are two dates that will be on my tombstone, the day I was born and the day I died. I want to have that dash in between the two mean something. And as my current president here at Morehouse said, it's not necessarily about the legacy you leave, but the vibration that you make in the earth. And that's what I, I, I would like to do. And that's how I would like to leave and end up. Mm, awesome. Awesome stuff. Uh, Mr. Hector, I really appreciate you coming on the show. I learned a lot. Um, you know, I, I definitely look forward to keeping up with some of the updates with your podcast and, you know, maybe even seeing you as a, a president of a school and, and hopefully before it's all said and done, you know, you can, we, we, you can bring your talents to uh, Howard in some way, shape or form. So I appreciate you coming on the show again. And what, what's the website again? Is GeraldHector.com? It's just GeraldHector.com. Okay. Yeah, okay, GeraldHector.com. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. So now we, we're going to transition into some trivia. See what you know <laughs> okay. about Howard. He's going to ask a few <laughs> questions. I think right. it could be uh, pretty easy for you because you work in uh, higher education. So you okay. probably know a lot of these things. So I Probably. I guess, let's see. Let's go. <laughs> All right. So who? question number one, who was Howard named after? Oliver Otis Howard. Okay, you got that one. Um, what's the name of the student newspaper at Howard? Hilltop. What's the Howard motto? In English or in service and truth. Now you're going to get me with the Latin. I can't remember the Latin. That's okay. That's good enough. Finish this sentence. Uh, reared against the eastern sky. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you got me there. I haven't sung that in a long time. You got Probably me there. there on Hilltop High. Yeah, there you go. All right. Um, what's the name of that neighborhood that Howard is located? The neighborhood? Yeah, Ledroit, not Ledroit. Ledroit is just down the street. It's Ledroit Park. Ledroit Park, yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. That's close. Um, how many schools and colleges does Howard have? That I don't remember. Has 13. 13. Um, I was going to say 14. That's okay. And yeah, uh, yeah. an easy one for you. What year was Howard founded? 1867. Very good. Very good. I think, and it was, I was reading something somewhere that the relationship with Morehouse and Howard, I forgot what it was. Um, I think, I, you know what, I'm doing some research on that. Here we have Dr. Lawrence Carter is the dean of the Martin Luther King Chapel, and he is a walking encyclopedia. I think there's a Howard grad, I might get this wrong, but maybe Howard Thurman, I, I might be wrong. But there is a Howard um, Morehouse connection that I want to learn more about. Yeah, I, for, I read it a long time yeah. ago and I forgot it. I, w I was looking for it when yeah. I, you were coming. One of our right. trustees, Dr. Uh, C. David Moody, a very successful businessman here, one of the most successful black construction folks in, in Atlanta. He's a Morehouse, grad, Morehouse and Howard grad. Really? That's yeah. pretty cool. So he and I always go back and forth because he chooses Morehouse first and I'm like Howard first, you know, <laughs> but he's a unique man. Once again, the Bison and the HBCU world prepares you. He's a very successful construction um, gentleman down here in Atlanta. One of the okay. top businessmen in the city. Very nice. Very nice. All right. This is the last part. So you just got to uh, answer it and you cannot expound on it. You just got to give the answer. <laughs> All right. All right, so number one, uh, burr or green? 
Burr. <laughs> CPA or MBA? CPA. Homecoming, orientation, or graduation? Homecoming. Um, homecoming better as alumni or as undergrad? Undergrad. Um, U Street or Adams Morgan? U Street. Morehouse or Howard? <laughs> Howard. <laughs> is it is it who you know or what you know? Hmm. What you know? Leaders born or leaders made? Leaders made. When Jamaica. Jamaica or who? What's the other? Thing? No, just what, what comes to mind when I say Jamaica? One word, huh? What comes to mind? Irie. <laughs> what, what was that? Irie, Irie. <laughs> Irie, okay, okay. Yeah. All right, well, that's it. So I'm going to, I'm um, again, I want to thank you for coming on the show. Definitely yes, appreciate sir. it. Thank you for joining the HU Movemaker Podcast, where we highlight folks that have contributed to the Howard legacy at the highest levels. To hear more interviews or purchase merchandise, please visit www.humovemakers.com.